The British Army of the American Revolution. Like most British armies throughout history, they were overstretched, under-resourced and fighting thousands of miles from home against a tough and determined enemy. But what do we really know about these men in the red coats? Were they the proverbial scum of the earth? Was the army their only option to avoid the gutter? And what about the officers? Were they foppish dandies or oafish brutes? <laughs> or were they in fact well-trained, well-dedicated professional soldiers? Well, today I'm joined by author and historian Robbie McNibben to discover the answer to all of these questions as well as lots more. Robbie has written a book about the 33rd Regiment of Foot on campaign during the revolution. It's called The Pattern and I've posted a link below. And by the way guys, stay tuned till the end to learn the surprising truth about how well trained the Redcoats were, how long their training was and what sort of training they actually did. Oh, come on, hurry up! Man, you got it. There's this idea that the rank and file of the British Army of the period were kind of, using a Wellington quote, the scum of the earth, which has been debunked um, and is being debunked more and more comprehensively. I'm not really sure how much it ever applied to the Revolutionary War. I think in the Napoleonic and Victorian era conflicts, uh, it's more pronounced. Um, yeah, I think that there's maybe an argument that the class system is setting in even more ferociously, certainly by the Victorian periods. And the difference between officers and men is maybe the root of this idea that the officers are all aristocratic dandies and the men are all vagabonds, criminals and wastrels and scoundrels and drunkards and murderers and thieves and rogues and all of that uh, stuff, which is kind of popularised as well in popular fiction by stuff like Sharp, maybe, because, you know, it makes for a good story if you have this uh, dichotomy and these scrappy guys who are coming up from the bottom. Bastard. So that's kind of the stereotype. I'm not sure if it, it has ever applied as much to the Revolutionary War, but there is this idea that the British soldier, the ordinary British soldier is a sort of robotic automaton that's controlled by discipline and uh, would give in to his horrible base desires if uh, he wasn't, which is basically just myth-making. King George and old England forever! There's... Uh, several dozen accounts from ordinary soldiers during the revolutionary period and uh, they don't really point towards the army as being a, a last place of refuge for the destitute. None of the accounts say that I joined the army because I was dirt poor or homeless or had no other prospects. It's nearly always more nebulous kind of things like a yearning for adventure or um, patriotism, which seems to be undervalued in this period, people kind of think is the, the revolutionary forces are the patriotic ones who are fighting for their, their country and their liberty and their freedom and ideology, whereas um, soldiers belonging to the European regimes are kind of just, as I said, um, criminals with no other option. But that's not the case. Um, British soldiers in the period are fighting for king and country, literally, and that is another motivating factor for joining up. I have some data about the soldiers, specifically in the 33rd, uh, regarding things like their previous jobs. So there's a huge range of professions that the soldiers, or men that became soldiers, did before joining up. You can probably see on the screen there's people who were potters and uh, steermen and linen printers, tailors, hatters, cutlers, shoemakers, all sorts of jobs. The interesting thing about these are that in the 18th century society that they came from, there were gradations and levels of skill, which sadly isn't recorded here. So we can see someone who might be a tailor, for example. We know they were a tailor, but we don't know what level of a tailor they were. They could have been a tailor's apprentice or they could have been a master tailor. And there's a very big gap in between there in terms of... Uh, sort of the money they'd be earning, just their social prestige, things like that. But we can see that there's a huge range of expertise. And actually that expertise is required by the military because uh, a regiment kind of functions as its own little ecosystem, if you will. And it requires people who are shoemakers to mend the men's shoes. And these are just ordinary soldiers, but they were shoemakers previously, so they have the expertise. Likewise with tailors, um, soldiers who had been tailors would be employed as tailors as a side job in the army to make sure that the regiment's uniforms are all up to scratch. Some 
some evidence of economic hardship involved in, in joining up, in so much as one of the most popular previous occupations for a soldier in this period was um, weaver. And that is, we can assume, because the weaving industry in the 1760s and 70s and 80s was suffering from the first rumbles of what became the um, Industrial Revolution. There were industrial processes that were being involved in weaving, which was causing people to lose their jobs. You lose their jobs to the machines, which I feel for in the age of AI. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Bastard. The other biggest previous occupation, if you can call it that, is simply labourer, which is for the period kind of a catch-all phrase for people who did seasonal jobs uh, to keep themselves in employment. And again, that kind of lends itself to the military life because the army is a stable form of uh, a stable source of food and money sometimes. Yeah, these things do kind of push people towards enlistment, but the idea that uh, it's something that you only do because you don't have any other job to go to is certainly exaggerated. Uh, as is the idea that it was something that criminals would do. The army did, during the revolutionary period, just have some amount of ex-convicts or people who had been offered prison or the army. There was a very small amount, I think about 3%. But the army desperately didn't want to rely on this because somewhat obviously these kinds of people don't make good soldiers. And the British army of the period, unlike the navy, was entirely volunteer based. The army didn't want loads of unwilling recruits. It wants people who kind of want to be there at least. And the idea is that that then makes for a better soldier. 3% of the army during the height of the revolution were ex-criminals just by necessity, desperation for manpower. But even of that 3%, I think very few were sent to regiments deployed um, to combat theatres. So almost no one doing the actual fighting are men of ill repute, shall we say. The next thing that's of interest that we can look at is place of birth. Now, the 33rd Regiment looks like it was mainly recruited from Yorkshire during that period. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So during this period, regiments aren't technically, um, officially tied to regions. Uh, if you study the British Army later on, then you know that most regiments are uh, have a regional affiliation. The first regiment of foot, the Royal Scots, for example, recruit where, or re traditionally recruited where I live currently in Edinburgh. So they're kind of like an Edinburgh regiment. So uh, during the 1760s and 70s, this was the case, but unofficially. So regiments uh, often had an idea that they were based around a certain region, but that wasn't a formal thing at that point. So the 33rd, for some reason, had grown up to have an affiliation with Yorkshire, specifically West Riding, so the west of Yorkshire. And it did a lot of recruiting there, and over the decades since it had been formed, it was founded in, I think, the early, the start of the 1700s. Uh, so over the preceding sort of six decades, it had kind of built up a, a rapport with Yorkshire. So it was seen as the local regiment, and it's the regiment that local lads would be most likely to join. And this is slightly more stark than it is for a lot of regiments. Like I said, this was still a de developing thing. And it's interesting because it's during the revolution, at the very end of the revolution, that this is formalized. So in 18, uh, 1782, uh, which is the last year of the war, it ends in 1783, the uh, 33rd are formalized as the West Riding or Regiment. So basically the Yorkshire Regiment, they're given that as part of their title because the army is trying to promote this idea that regiments are based in certain regions because they think it will help with recruitment and kind of an esprit de corps sort of feeling. So the 33rd are already recruiting heavily from Yorkshire and even more heavily than most regiments are in their home regions. They do have a very strong link with the area. So yes, Yorkshire recruits make up probably overall just under half of the regiment, which is quite a lot really. Uh, and then the remainder are mostly from elsewhere in England, um, quite a lot from neighbouring areas. Uh, there's a strong Irish contingent. Um, in the sample that I had of 61 men, there's about, oh, I can't remember, I think about 11 from Ireland, a bit over 10%, um, between 10 and 20%. As the period goes on, there's more and more Irish recruitment because the British establishment kind of takes advantage of its 
stranglehold in Ireland to bulk up recruiting. But uh, for the 33rd, they aren't a, a huge number, but they're still the second largest after the English contingent. So the other interesting thing that you found in your book was the, the height of soldiers. I always imagine them as being these sort of short, stunted men who probably ate terribly growing up. Shall we have a look at the graphics and see if, see if uh, the, the figures back that up? Yes and no. Um, so the idea that people in the past were really short is nebulous because it's true to an extent, but not as true as people make out. They weren't tiny. Uh, again, we're maybe thrown slightly because the height of people in the later period, in the Victorian period, I think was a bit shorter, at least for the working class or people that became regular soldiers, uh, as you say, due to some you know, level of malnourishment and the horrors of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, during the American Revolution, I think I'm right in saying that the average male height was about 5'8", maybe 5'9". I think today it's 5'11". So yes, people were a bit smaller, but no, they weren't really shockingly, noticeably smaller. So yes, it's reflected to an extent in the 33rd, although one inspection return pointed out quite specifically that they were quite a short bunch, just in terms of the regiment and the average of the period height. So maybe we're seeing figures that are skewed a little bit towards the shorter end of things uh, with the regiment. Certainly people weren't as tall necessarily as they are today, on the upper end of things. So there's only three men out of the 350 in the inspection in 1775 who are six foot and over. Uh, there's just one guy who's six foot one. Uh, most of them tend to fall between five foot seven and uh, about five ten. But uh, yeah, they weren't um, especially short uh, compared to the modern day. They were just a bit shorter. Which, to be fair, does still shock me because having reenacted the unit and having to wield things like uh, the muskets and stuff like that, which are pretty long, uh, especially there's two different types. There's the short, the short land and the long land pattern, and even the short land pattern is pretty long. The long land pattern is really long. So wielding those things when you're sort of five, 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 six can't have been fun, but that's just how they were, and they got on with it. So they were they were tough lads. They didn't mess around. They were. They certainly were. And then another interesting stat you've got is years of service in the 33rd by number of men. This is from 1775. What did you, what did you learn from this, Robbie, that maybe surprised you or that you found interesting? Yeah, so you can kind of gauge a regiment's um, ability to an extent by their years of service and how long sort of the average soldier has been in it. I think overall during this period, the average British soldier tended to have, oh, it's difficult to say because obviously the army recruits heavily to bring up numbers as the war progresses, but five, ten years of service wasn't uncommon. The average age of a soldier was often later than we kind of imagine for soldiers these days. So I think the modern view of a soldier, especially in a, a large scale conflict where there's heavy recruitment, is of a, a fairly young guy. Thanks to conscription and things like the First World War, the Second World War, we have this idea of the youthful soldier, you know, who's patriotic and joins up as soon as they're able to at 18 or is dragged into the military and conscripted at a young age. In the 18th century, this wasn't the case as much. So I think about 25 is a pretty solid average um, for a British soldier um, for this period. And then in terms of service, yes, five to 10 years, uh, NCOs tended to be quite experienced, 10, 15, even 20 years. Another thing that might be quite shocking to modern sensibilities is the lack of promotion prospects, shall we say. And this isn't necessarily a dig at the men previously mentioned class system of, you know, if you're an ordinary soldier, you'll never become an officer. That wasn't necessarily the case. But for most men, you simply didn't progress in the army. It wasn't something you expected to do. You don't have the sort of modern system we're used to today where you get a job and then you know that if you just sit tight on that job and you mean you don't mess up too badly and you probably get some sort of promotion in three or four years and then another one in a few more years and the promotions just roll in. That isn't the case in the 18th century necessarily for any kind of job um, and it isn't the case for the military either. So it's not uncommon for a soldier to serve for the full period of 20 plus years and they're just a private soldier at the end of it. 
and that's just how it goes. Am I right in thinking that in those days you did sign on for life and generally that was, you know, 20 plus years before you were generally sort of burnt out and laid off, so to speak? Exactly, yes. It's a life thing. Uh, you don't really get to leave unless you're injured. Uh, you sign on and you would just expect to then be a soldier for as long as possible. And the Chelsea records, which I mentioned, the pension records, they record why a soldier leaves the army. And it's nearly always either some sort of injury or just the phrase they use is worn out, which can cover basically just getting old and having marched <laughs> for about 20 years of your life. The knees aren't great. The legs aren't great. The back isn't great. I imagine, and uh, they're just not Sounds fit. like me. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm getting there as well. <laughs> um, they're no longer fit, to, fit for service, which again is a period term which is used to just donate that, you know, they're kind of done. And at that point they leave, and if they're lucky, they'll get a Chelsea pension. But yeah, you, you join the army, you wouldn't really be expecting to get promotion, and you wouldn't expect to leave until you don't, you're not able to carry on anymore. A hard life for sure, but the 33rd did have an advantage that many other regiments did not, which was a great colonel. It was none other than Charles Cornwallis. Yep, you may have heard of him, Americans will know him as the British commander who lost at Yorktown, but there's so much more to him than that. Now, now's not the time for a deep dive into his life, but suffice it to say, the 33rd was an excellent regiment, partly due to him. Anyway, what about the officers? Let's find out a bit more. And therefore, I suppose, sir, the British officer need not know his business. The British soldier will get him out of all his blunders with a bayonet. Were officers these sort of foppish wimps, or were they actually well-trained professional men? What can you tell us? So about 95% are well-trained professional men, and then the 5% gives the rest a bad name, which I think is often the case. <laughs> uh, so stereotypes often, they don't come out of, out of nothing. There were officers promoted based on wealth and aristocratic privilege, and some of them probably didn't deserve to be where they were. <laughs> that was certainly an exception to the rule, though. The vast majority of officers in this period are from a moderately privileged background, but no more than that. They're kind of what we would today think of as middle class or upper middle class. That concept is still kind of developing in this period, so we can't say that that's what they're like, but they aren't really well off or wealthy. They come from sort of the landed gentry, but you know they don't have huge estates. They maybe have a bit of land that they own uh, and a few servants back home, which to us sounds very extravagant, but for that period is not really crazy. It's not uncommon. They join the army because it's a profession. They don't join it because they see it as like a side gig to going into politics or something like that. They join it because kind of like with the enlisted men, they want to, they expect that to be their career basically for, for the rest of their lives or certainly for the better part of their lives. And uh, they don't tend to do it for the money because Army pays and greats, and the uh, letters written by officers in the period and the diaries they keep are almost always bemoaning their financial woes. So they tend to not be hugely well off, certainly better off than the men they're commanding, but um, in the scale of things, they don't tend to be rich kids. And they are promoted partly on merit. So uh, officers, again, this is kind of the thing that gives the military a bad rep in this period. Officers have to pay for their commission. So there's this concept that, that keeps ordinary people out and ensures that you can only afford to become an officer if you have the money. And uh, that's not entirely fair because the army is aware that this isn't necessarily a great thing to do and they're trying to regulate it. Uh, so they set like uh, minimum prices and things for commissions in this period. It will continue for another century. It's not until the Victorian era that it's abolished in full. So if it's a poorly run regiment with a kind of dodgy colonel, then, you know, there might be issues with people being promoted based on wealth rather than um, competence. But that isn't the case with the 33rd. Wallace is very much about making sure that it's a good uh, functioning regiment and he knows that he requires good officers and NCOs. He's so attuned to detail that he knows who his best sergeants are in the regiment. Um, he's not kind of like an absentee landlord in that regard. So he makes sure that the officers that he's got in the 33rd, the company level officers, are good at their jobs. Nearly all of them have been around for at least a decade before they receive a company command, before they're promoted to captain. Um, the average, I think, is about a decade of experience. Uh, 
which shows that you know they probably they know what they're doing. And I think that's reflected when they actually end up in combat. Um, but yeah, certainly in the th thirds case, it's not um, the idea that the officers kind of don't know what they're doing and they just let the sergeants run it. And it's a bit more complex than that. I think as well, there's something which I didn't appreciate before I did the research for the book is that there isn't as harsh of a um, discipline regimen involved as we imagine looking back. So again, the stereotype of the army is very harsh discipline, almost sort of Prussian style discipline, men being flogged for minor infractions, officers ruling with a grip of iron. And that is only the case in a very few incidents. So there's this give and take, this undercurrent, which kind of exists beneath the official regulations of the army, which um, isn't necessarily, or hasn't been appreciated until more recent research, that shows that officers can't just do whatever they want. They aren't sort of many dictators. They can't um, make un unreasonable demands of their men. They can't mistreat them. Um, they could technically kind of get away with that kind of thing, which is where the stereotypes come from. But in reality, they are often going to find themselves frozen out of command if they're shown to be basically incompetent or nefarious. So the soldiers know this. They know that it, an officer, it's like this right and privilege kind of thing. Uh, the officers have this privilege, but they have to fulfill certain uh, rights that the soldiers have. And so that is namely things like food, making sure that the men are properly fed, because there's this understanding that soldiers will simply take what they need if they don't receive what they need. You know, they are, will forage, and if they're on campaign, they will loot. And if an officer isn't providing for them, then they kind of say, well, you're not giving us what we need to subsist. We're not getting basic things like rations, so what do you expect? And that's kind of understood as, you know, fair enough um, during this period. Uh, and if they're sort of particularly harsh disciplinarians, soldiers do have some recourse to complain to their NCOs. There's records of them doing this. And while, you know, there isn't necessarily an official process where the NCOs are going to call an officer to task, they'll make it known and other more competent officers will often then give a bit of a cold shoulder to the, the bad officer in their bunch and they'll quickly find themselves in hot water and often moved on, shall we say, um, either given less prestigious positions, maybe sent out as a recruiter instead of being on campaign or just kind of shifted out of the regiment. And the 33rd is a good example of this because Cornwallis would not stand for that kind of behavior from his officers. And there are instances of him kind of chivying along people and using his aristocratic privilege to actually make sure that the, the dandy types aren't the ones that are gonna be seen combat and it's the, the good officers that are gonna be in the thick of things. Another question I wanted to ask was regarding training. Did the men and the officers actually receive a lot of training or was it all just, you know, you reach your unit and you pick it up as you go? What did you learn about that? Have you any idea of the average marksmanship of the army of His Majesty King George III? If we make up a firing party, what will happen? Half of them will miss you, and the rest will make a mess of the business and leave you to the Provost Marshal's pistol. Yes, so the training is actually, um, it is quite important in this period. It's not something that's necessarily talked about a great deal because histories like to focus on the exciting battles and things. They don't look at the logistics or the things prior to that. There's a very good book on the subject called Fit for Service by um, a historian called Holding, which is one of my favorite books in the period. It's, it sounds as though it's just gonna be about the sort of the training, which some might consider a bit mundane and boring, but it actually covers a huge range of topics um, in the 18th century uh, British military. But yes, training is, is reasonably vigorous, not as vigorous as we have it today, but it's uh, considered important. A soldier isn't sent out uh, off really before they've had at least a year of training, like proper training. And this is even at the height of the war. So when the army is desperately strapped for numbers, uh, it's having to hire, you know, uh, German troops, Hessians, just to fill the gaps in, um, in the numbers being sent to America. Even then it doesn't compromise on this year's worth of training, often sometimes more than that, two years of training. Wow. prior to sending soldiers out because it understands that there's no point in the same sense that you shouldn't sort of just empty jails to make up numbers it wants volunteers to be soldiers 
it also wants these soldiers to be well enough trained so that when they actually reach combat, they make a difference. So uh, training begins right when a soldier first enlists, when they're with uh, the recruiting party. So that's normally how they enlist. They join the recruiting party, which travels around the country, or at least the local region the regiment is affiliated to. And um, they then join that party. And they'll maybe be with that group for a few weeks or even months as that group continues to move around the country and take on recruiting. Groups. And during that period, they are given their first bits of kit, which is some clothing, um, a cockade for the hat, and they are taught things like how to march, for example, and bearing, military bearing, so standing up straight, that kind of thing. And when the recruiting party has filled out its quota, they're then all taken to a barrack somewhere or a training area, and obviously there'll be more troops there either a company or even a whole battalion, and they'll be put through their paces. Firstly, it's broke up into specific stages, so learning how to march, um, learning maneuvers, being given weaponry, their firearm, learning how to handle it, uh, the different exercises or levels of exercise, so um, obviously individual weapons handling and then moving on to firing in platoons. Um, platoon firing is quite complex in the period, so you could deliver it various different ways, uh, maneuvering in bigger groups, so uh, within a company, within a battalion, if possible, uh, in a brigade level even. And once they've been through all that, uh, normally that takes about a year, and then they'll be sent with a group to join their battalion. The training continues uh, if the battalion is still in Britain, because they move around the countryside on garrison duties, but then they also continue to train and drill as they're performing these duties. So during peacetime, for example, regiments are often employed in uh, anti-smuggling operations. There was a lot of smuggling in 18th century Britain, so they'd be deployed to the coasts to try and catch smugglers, or they'd be involved in uh, buildings, uh, sort of construction, so either building forts or roads. The army was used basically as like a semi-free labor force um, to construct roads throughout the UK at this time. So in between all of that, they would continue to sort of train and drill and they would um, operate um, in groups of multiple companies, battalions, or even brigades at uh, regimental reviews. So the army is quite particular in making sure that regiments are up to scratch and every regiment has to uh, receive a review once a year from a senior officer who then takes notes on everything from uh, uniforms, uh, the how well kept the equipment is, and they obviously then perform things like firing drills um, so that they can get a gauge on how, basically just how competent they are um, as soldiers. But occasionally regiments will also be grouped together for mock battles where they basically run through simulated combat against each other using blanks. And uh, these can be quite large scale and quite complex. So just before the revolution, the 33rd are involved in a large scale um, operation in Ireland where they conduct a fake amphibious landing, fight a battle and then have to storm a fort. So basically ticking off the, the major operational uh, or tactical things that they'd be expected to do, especially in this period, the, the British Army is expected to operate closely with the Royal Navy in terms of amphibious operations. So being sure that they could do that was an important um, aspect and it isn't neglected even in peacetime. Uh, it's quite amazing yeah, yeah. because we, we have an image, don't we, that the army was very unprofessional at this time. We, we assume mm -hmm. they didn't really bother training. The soldiers were out getting drunk while the officers were at dances with pretty ladies. And actually, it sounds like uh, a lot of what we do these days in the British Army, or a lot of what the British Army does, is what they were doing back then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, there's a solid basis of training. And not to say that, again, there wasn't some neglect and... As I said, the regiment kind of depends on its colonel, and if it's a bad colonel, then the training's not great either. But for the most part, there's a basic standard that everyone's expected to be able to meet. And uh, for the most part, they, they keep to it, which, yeah, they consider it an, an important thing. Some surprising stuff from Robbie there, wasn't there? He really does know what he's talking about. And we're not finished with Robbie. This interview was actually quite long. I've got probably three more videos I want to make from our chat. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on those episodes. And also, I did want to talk briefly about one other thing I think you're going to find interesting, which is the Victorian Military Society.
Now I recently joined the council of the VMS and they've got a couple of events coming up, one of which I wanted to talk about now. So on Saturday the 18th of May, there's the VMS event in Winchester, which is at the Gurkha Museum Peninsula Barracks. Tickets are 30 quid each, you get coffee on arrival, a buffet lunch and admission to all five museums in the town. There'll be a talk on the Military Academy for the East India Company at Addiscombe. That's by none other than Kate Burbeck, who I'm a big fan of. She's done some excellent work. And finally, if you love this sort of detailed military history and you're still watching now, then I highly recommend you sign up for my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com newsletter. When you do so, you'll get a small ebook all about the Battle of Isandwana, and I'll drop you a line about every month or so. All right, guys, see you soon.